Welcome back. So a video that is basically an introduction to cables and how to use them is uh, something that's probably best to be done pretty cut and dry, informative, and so it runs the risk of being probably a little bit boring, but I still feel like that's the best way to do it. And uh, so what I want to do is do it just uh, sections. So some stuff about power, some stuff about patch cables, about audio, about MIDI, about uh, USB. And I'm just going to put that all on the timeline. And if you have a specific thing, then just scrub to it. And hopefully you find the answer to some sort of question you might have or some insight in that section. If you have a specific question, feel free to leave me a comment and I will do my best to answer that. And so I want the informative part to take up probably the first two thirds of the video. And then uh, towards the end of the video, I want to do a little bit more of a, I guess, a philosophical type of part where the, uh, basically if you use different cables or uh, hook things up in different ways, you can have some creative opportunities for making music and sounds that you like. So. Uh, one example of that was at the very start of the video, and I'll try and show a couple more. So let's go ahead and get started. Alright, so some of the best advice that I can give you about your power supplies and cables that go with them for your gear is to stay organized. Now, one thing that I've tried that sort of seems to help is I use a silver Sharpie and, uh, you know, just in case maybe you're planning on uh, not keeping the gear or uh, don't want to have this written on there, you can put a piece of uh, just scotch tape on there and uh, then write on that. And uh, that's a pretty good way to keep track. And then I also went through sort of a plastic bag phase. So this is my Organelle power supply. But if you take it out and things get separated, that can lead to problems. You can see I've got a little piece of uh, masking tape with it written on there. Not really surviving that well. And with this Volcamix power supply, you'll see that there's a Korg label on there that sort of can help things stay organized. But a lot of stuff is just a generic power supply that ships with the gear. And so you really need to try to keep track of things. But then one of the most important things of this whole video, maybe the most important thing, is has to do with guitar effect pedals. And so I have got a uh, power supply for the pedal here. Um, I might could do this with a magnifying glass, but it's probably going to be a little hard to see. Uh, yeah, I'll just call it out. This is a 9-volt power supply, and, uh, you know, that's typical for a guitar pedal. But then the organelle power supply that I had, that is also nine volts. And so, for example, this organelle power supply will work on this thing, which is the Basel Time. Goes right in there, just fine. And this seems sort of like a pedal where it has a stereo input, two mono outs, it does uh, delay type effects. So it seems almost like a pedal but this is a true pedal the same power supply will fit in there so you can't necessarily go by whether it fits or not and you can't necessarily go by the voltage because these both have the same voltage and the guitar pedal one will fit into the time but the problem is is that both of these are incompatible and uh, the reason for that has to do with whether the center pin of the conductor is positive or negative. So these are the two plugs for the two power supplies and they look quite similar, but guitar pedals traditionally have a negative center pin. And then a lot of other similar power supplies have a positive center pin. And the way that you can tell that is you Look on here. I really want to try and get close enough to where you can see that. Um, 
All right, it looks best on the guitar pedal. I think you can kind of make that out. It's starting to blur. Um, so, negative center pin on a guitar pedal. And you just have to check the little icon. And what I do when I get a new power supply for guitar pedals, it's just my own convention. I put a blue label on them. And so you certainly do need to worry about whether uh, the voltage of a power supply is right, whether it fits or not, and uh, you know, things like the current or power, you may, don't hold me to it, but you probably typically find that that's less critical because it'll either work or it won't. But this polarity of the two different types of power supplies, guitar pedals versus literally everything else, the polarity mismatch is something that can lead to hurting your gear. So just make sure that you use guitar pedal power supplies with guitar pedals and everything else, don't use guitar pedal power supplies. I think that's probably about it for power. All right, so I sort of feel like patch cables get a bad rap because they're associated with modular synthesis, which is, uh, it could be pretty complicated, but the I think the reason that I want to sort of start talking about this is because the cables themselves are quite simple and uh, we're going to get to audio, we'll get to MIDI, we'll get to USB, but you can think of a patch cable as sort of a, a cable that carries basically any other type of signal. And so that's why I feel like the two conductor patch cable is the place to start. So let's take a look at one. This is the uh, sort of humble, basic uh, patch cable, two conductors. What I figured I would do, I thought about using a magnifier to show it a little bit bigger, but let's just look at a guitar cable. So um, to clarify some terminology, a patch cable is a, a two conductor TS cable. So there's a tip conductor and a sleeve conductor. and uh, Sometimes I might say shield, uh, that'll become apparent why, but tip and sleeve for the TS plug. And uh, this is the plug and the thing that it goes in, I refer to as the jack. And the smaller one is a, a eighth of an inch or 3.5 millimeter. And uh, normally this bigger one is referred to as a quarter inch cable. And again, uh, You'll uh, see it as an instrument cable, guitar cable, quarter inch TS cable. It's all sort of the same thing. And this one you'll see as a patch cable or a uh, eighth inch mono cable, 3.5 millimeter mono cable. And so just different names for the same thing. Now, uh, the reason that I picked starting with a two conductor cable instead of a one conductor cable is because this two conductor cable is more general and it actually makes a lot of sense why okay what it is is that the sleeve conductor is commonly a ground and then the tip conductor is commonly a signal and uh, to try and clarify that uh, i have this thermometer out here to remind me that uh, think about if we had say a temperature system where the uh, people talked about numbers, 30 degrees, 50 degrees, or whatever, but that uh, nobody had established what zero degrees was. And so uh, something like the uh, uh, Celsius system where zero is established by the temperature of freezing water, that's something that everybody can communicate about temperatures with. And so you can think of communication between different parts of your gear where the the patch cable, the sleeve part, provides grounding and so that when one part of your gear has a signal at a certain voltage, the fact that the ground is communicated by that cable in every case, that allows the other piece of gear that you're hooking it to to have the same zero. So voltage is a relative thing and uh, by always having a sleeve conductor that has the uh, ground defined, that lets the signals that are being transmitted through patch cables have a well-defined meaning. And this sort of grounding on the sleeve, you'll see that it's also in the next section about audio cables. 
it's just one thing that allows us to be able to hook gear from one place to another. So an audio signal to a mixer or from one modular, uh, say a pod, to something that's standalone like a semi-modular synth. Uh, Co-grounding is a very important thing. And just to clarify what I mean by a signal on this uh, tip conductor, I mean things that are um, basically... It can be audio signals, it can be modulation signals, which is a time-varying voltage, or a control voltage. It can be things like triggers and gates. And uh, so basically you'll see that almost anything can be sent through this type of cable or the uh, three-conductor version of it. So we'll see it in MIDI, we'll see it in audio. Uh, we won't see it in power because these are not very good for power since it leaves the conductor exposed. Uh, there might be some cases for low power stuff where you could do it with a patch cable like this, but generally not. Now, there are some different versions, like this is an inline one, uh, this is a right angle one, does the exact same thing. I tend to like these for when I'm just doing something on my own. These are really nice for a video because they get the wire flat and out of the way, but uh, I wouldn't typically get the right angle type of patch cable because uh, they sort of interfere with one another. Now, uh, I just wanted to show another type of thing related to uh, two conductor patch cables, and that is MULTS, M-U-L-T-S. And it just means sort of like a multiplier where the, if I have this type of patch cable, which is a stackable MULT, um, it lets me plug it in somewhere, plug it in over here, and I can sort of connect things in a chain by putting them into the top stack, and malts can be stacked in that case. Now, there's another type of malt called a knuckle bone, and this thing is very powerful because you can put uh, one signal in here, fan it out to five others, or you can think of some cases where you might be fanning in multiple signals into one, then the last thing, I hadn't really ever done this much, but it is possible to use, this is a uh, straightforward uh, headphone splitter sharing jack, so if two people want to listen to one thing, uh, you both plug your headphones into there. This actually can be used as a malt for patch cables. So uh, anyway, that's all I want to say about the two conductor type. But I do want to talk a little bit about one conductor and three conductor cables. All right, so I show one conductor patch cable stuff on this channel all the time. If you think about it with the uh, castles or with the Volca modular, this thing, which is a, uh, it's called a DuPont cable or a uh, maybe a DuPont connector. And uh, I've also heard it referred to as a pin cable or a mini patch cable. But anyway, it's got one conductor. And so it works just fine, like on the Volca modular, as long as you're just patching to uh, the Volca modular sort of within. Um, and that's because everything is co-grounded because it's all part of the same piece of gear. But then as you start to do things like try to have one castle talk to the other, that sort of thing, then you have to think about some sort of mutual grounding, which you can do by patching or through the audio jacks. But I just wanted to bring it up because uh, it is one of the more important things of like, well, how do I hook this to that? And so if you have a specific question about it, then feel free to leave me a comment and I'll give you the best advice I can. Now, I thought about it and I do have one other piece of gear um, that uses one conductor patch cables. And that is the, the latest two. And uh, this is basically a sampler that uses these uh, little banana cables. So this is just one conductor. It kind of looks like an aux, but it's not. It's just one conductor. Uh, this is one type of banana cable. Um, I've got another one here. Um, you know, this is something you might see like on Heinbach or somebody that has a book synthesizer or something like that, where that it's just one conductor. And they're almost always uh, stackable, so uh, this allows all kinds of uh, different interconnections. And uh, even this type is stackable where they have a uh, 
basically a through hole here that you can uh, put it in at a right angle like I've done here I'll just play some Delatalus 2 for a second <laughs> I am going to move on to three conductor patch cables for just a few minutes, but then uh, I figured, I don't know, the, maybe I'm the person that gets the most out of this video because I started playing with the Delatalus 2 a little bit, and uh, I like it more. I think I understand it better than I did. Um, I've just got a speaker held up to the mic, but I'll, I'll play a little bit of uh, just some samples that you program with these patch cables. It's kind of cool. I mean, you guessed it, this is basically just an aux cable, but in some cases you might think of it as a um, three conductor patch cable. Um, let's take a look at the bigger version of this. Um, so this is, um, instead of a TS cable, now it's referred to as a TRS cable. So it's got tip on the end, ring in the middle, and uh, sleeve at the base there. And so the main way that that comes up in terms of patching would be on something like the castle or other similar types of devices where that you've got an IO port that is a uh, two channel IO port, a left and a right. And you put that in there and then you'd be able to um, take two signals, one in the left, one into the right. And then this is the castle drum. If I had the castle synth, I could transmit those signals to the uh, castle synth. That's one way. So you can sort of think of a three conductor patch cable as a two signal patch cable of one ground. But it starts to get more useful when you have a Y cable, something like this one, which is a three conductor and two, two conductors. And so uh, let me get the big version to clarify that that um so i've got a sleeve ring tip on one side but then on the other side i've got two different um, monos or single uh, signal ones the sleeves are all connected so every sleeve is connected but then the uh, tip goes to one of these tips so the tip on the three conductor, I should say, goes to one of these tips, and then the ring goes to the other one. And uh, when I get into the audio section on this, you'll see that there are lots of different types of Y cables, but that's the most straightforward one, where it just splits stereo into mono left and mono right. Now, this is the sort of thing that's important for patching because it lets us uh, take something like a uh, castle and plug the stereo one into there so a two signal patch cable it's made for that and then uh, the two uh, single signal uh, things could go for example into cv and gate on a sequencer so these are more like normal single conductor patch uh, sockets or jacks over here and then the y cable lets us feed both of them into something like the castle and then I should also mention that this type of Y cable can be handy if you're doing stuff with a pocket operator and trying to hook it to other gear where you want to use the audio signal and the sync signal separately. Uh, there's a bunch of different sync modes on the pocket operators and uh, depends a lot on what your application is. Now, the last three conductor thing that I want to talk about is just that when you buy a Volca, it comes with an aux cable and that's what's used to... Uh, do the syncing between one Volca and another Volca, so that is a timing signal. And so I just want to say that in terms of sort of modular synthesis and sort of a more 
abstract type of definition. Whenever you hook one Volca, the sync, to another Volca, you're basically doing modular synthesis with a trigger signal. And uh, I'm going to show a demo towards the end of the video that is going to make it clear, hopefully, that this is not just like sort of a theoretical hair splitting type thing, that if you start to think of this in sort of a modular type of way that it can change some of the things that you actually do with your Volcas. So we'll get to that, but now it's time to move on to audio. All right, so just to be clear in this case, uh, when I say mono, I mean monaural one audio channel versus stereo, and nothing to do with whether it's monophonic signal source or mono synth or anything like that. Now. Uh, in the three and a half millimeter version, that's basically just a patch cable. So a two conductor with the tip that carries the audio signal and the sleeve that carries the ground that is the ground. And then I'm going to skip ahead and just talk about stereo for a second because it's relevant. Uh, with a stereo plug, you've got, and this is just, it's pretty easy to remember. It's, uh, the left is on the tip and then the ring is on the right. So that's sort of the mnemonic for a TRS cable is ring is on the right, uh, left is on the tip, and then again, the ground is on the sleeve. And so this is the reason that when you plug a mono signal source into something that is stereo, a lot of times it will just end up on the left side. So the left side of a field recorder, left side of headphones, left side of monitor speakers or something like that. And one of the most important points to make is that you can use commonly stereo plugs to sort of emulate or make do for mono plugs. So like this one, I love this cable. This is a Hosa um, quarter inch mono to 3.5 millimeter mono. And it's very handy, but if you had, for example, a headphone connector like this, that's uh, got uh, it's a TRS and you put that onto a standard aux cable this could just as well serve as a mono quarter inch to mono 3.5 millimeter but you got to bear in mind that it doesn't go the other way where that you can't use a mono cable in a stereo setup and sort of hope for the best that it will mix or something like that I will show you an example of where things can go awry in a second. Now, you'll notice in this section that I'm not doing things by the number of conductors because sometimes a mono signal can actually use three conductors. This is a so-called XLR cable, uh, female, uh, I guess male and female. Um, a lot of times you'll see this for microphones, field recorders, and uh, one thing to know is that a lot of times XLR cables are super long and why three conductors for just one signal? Uh, the reason is that it is what is called balanced. And so that means that one of these is a ground, one of these is the normal signal, and then one of these is the signal flipped. So uh, you can think of it as negated or inverted. Um, and then what happens is, is that if you pick up noise in a long cable like this, and mic cables typically have to be long to allow somebody to walk around or that sort of thing. If you pick up noise, you pick it up equally in both of the flipped and regular sound channels. And then you can do a subtraction operation electronically at the receiving end of the signal. And the noise will get canceled out and it will leave you with a better sound, better signal to noise ratio. And so balanced mono signals are on a three conductor cable like that, like the XLR, uh, and everything else, you know, that is typically used most of the time is just unbalanced. And since it's a shorter cable length, that tends to be okay. But now I want to show you sort of a, this is kind of a cautionary tale. I, I watched a YouTube video at one point it was a quite popular YouTuber and uh, they got kind of caught up in this problem and uh, I'll just show it to you. Um, but for the, the first thing I want to do is show you the microbrute for sort of contrast, which is that if you look on the back of the microbrute, there's a headphone jack, 3.5 millimeter, 
and a line out. And what happens is, is that if you plug headphones into that, even though this is mono, and this, this is common with a lot of synths, you'll get a uh, dual mono signal. So, you know, left ear, right ear, both hear the same thing. And it, it's pretty disconcerting to have to listen to just uh, in one ear. So uh, this is the type of thing that comes up all the time because of things like guitar pedals, where that you uh, send a signal through a guitar pedal and uh, you basically have to figure out a way to get that copied if you want to monitor it in real time. You can do it through a field recorder, through certain types of mixers and that sort of thing. But the microphone does it for you with the headphone jack. And so you hear sound on both sides. But then this line out on here is a quarter inch jack. And you can think of that as sort of more like a guitar cable, instrument cable port. And slightly softer volume and if you put headphones into there with the uh you know trs quarter inch jack you only hear it in the left side so makes perfect sense but then when you move on to the micro freak uh, you've got the following and uh, i'm going to just show you on the back here you've got the headphone jack same as before and then you have an output here and uh, so what i'm going to do is just do some experimentation basically and I'll show you what's going on uh, I'm going to put a uh, converter so there's a TRS converter into the input there and then I'm gonna um, let's see I'll just hook this speaker directly to the microfreak and Turn up the volume. And I hope you can hear that on my voice mic. Uh, it's got a, a nice bass signal. I love this preset. Okay, but then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull it out of here and put it into the line out. And you might think, oh, well, it'll just put it on the left side or something like that, uh, so it won't be a big deal. But when I do this, All right, it makes it sound completely different, and the bass is gone. And the whole uh, gist of that is that that line out is a balanced line out. Even, you know, you have to read the directions to figure it out. But if you just treat it as a typical line out or a dual stereo, or, or sorry, dual mono line out, uh, then you'll get caught up into a thing like this where what happens is, is that in this speaker, um, it's fine with a left and an inverted uh, left over here, just the main signal and then the inverted signal. Okay, but in the subwoofer where there's only one, it puts both of them into there and they go to zero, so uh, you end up with no bass at all. Now, I'm gonna show this in a more dramatic form with uh, this speaker, which is just a, you know, it's a Bluetooth speaker that it, does a mix of whatever you send to it by aux cable. So, got this. Let me unplug this. And I'll be able to hold this up by the mic a little bit more. Um, let's see. So. Not bad for, for a tiny speaker, but then when I put that in here, okay, nothing, zero. 
All right, because the whole thing is canceling out. I'll hold it right up there. Yep, I don't hear a thing. So uh, that was what happened on the YouTube video that I saw. Uh, and the thing is, is that you'll hear stuff on a speaker that has some sort of spread, but then uh, maybe you post it online or something like that, and somebody has a phone that only has one speaker. Most, speaker, most phones have two speakers now, but... Uh, Hadn't been that long since uh, phones only had one speaker. And so it might sound fine or more or less okay on your monitors. Uh, and then you post it and the sound just goes away. And this is the type of thing that happens with this balanced versus unbalanced source. But there's plenty of other ways that this can happen. And uh, one is if you use some sort of stereo spreading uh, effect. And that can be in a DAW or on an instrument. Like I think the Volca Mix has a stereo spread. Um, that will do the same type of thing where that it can sound perfectly fine on spread out speakers. But if somehow in the path it gets mixed, then it might go to something that is either gone or very low. And then another place I've seen this is where I didn't have a plug plugged in all the way. And it can do the same sort of thing. I had a th just a total mystery where that uh, the audio was there on my daughter's phone, which was a more modern phone than mine, but not there on my phone. And I thought for a long time that it had something to do with the phone software or phone hardware or whatever. But it was everything was just faithfully representing a thing where I had a signal on the left channel and then an inverted signal on the right channel. So. This is something to look out for when you're doing mono. Now let's move on to stereo. All right, so for talking about stereo, I mean, this is sort of the really the real deal about audio cables and connectors and stuff. And uh, I'm gonna just show a few things and then do a little bit of a demo about some things to look out for. So uh, to start with, I'll just say that uh, pretty much any cable that you can think of you can probably buy online. I mean, this is a TRS 3.5 millimeter male and a quarter inch TRS female. I think that came with like a modular synth or something like that. That one's pretty handy, but the um, I just figured I would show just some things like this is a, okay, this is a mono, uh, but it's RCA. And if you're not familiar with RCA, that's another type of uh, stereo where that, like on this end, I've got a TRS 3.5 millimeter. And then on this end, I've got the, you know, you'll see this like on uh, cassette decks and stereos and that sort of thing, at least in the past. Uh, so one channel, another channel, this element here on the outside, the fins is the ground on both of these and then the tip there is the signal and uh, this is something that uh, I think a SP404 uses this type of connector but you can basically find other stuff like okay here's one this is the uh, RCA RCA so I've made an aux cable with this in the middle and this raises the point of should you get a connector versus getting a cable and a lot of times that uh, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, sometimes you don't need that extra length, so it's like just makes it bulky. And it raises the whole idea of should you buy a custom thing. Uh, so, for example, uh, this thing that I showed in the previous section that's quarter inch mono to 3.5 millimeter mono. I have a bunch of these because I use them all the time. And so if I started trying to cobble them together out of other stuff like headphone adapters and aux cables i'd run out and so you just have to debate uh, depending on how frequently you use something whether you want it to be something that you build or something that you want to be monolithic uh, just some more examples here are some barrel connectors those are trs female on both sides um, i put this out here as a, sort of a favorite thing this is a uh, 3.5 millimeter stereo uh, male to female on the other side, but in between it has an attenuator. This is like a little headphone control, but 
I use it all the time to um, sort of attenuate the volume of synthesizers. Super handy, not expensive at all. I think it's just a few dollars and lots of different versions of that. Um, then one of the last ones here. This is probably one of the cables that I use the most. Um, it is 3.5 millimeter stereo on one side and then a uh, quarter inch mono on the other side. And uh, this is handy because uh, something like say a uh, model cycles or a Digitact or that type of thing, they have the quarter inch plugs, two of them. But then a lot of times I like to use a 3.5 millimeter plug for either a, a recorder or an effect like the NTS-1. So uh, this is the sort of thing that just comes up all the time. Like it goes with a mixer where the, maybe this uh, is coming out of the mixer, going into the field recorder. And so uh, that's one that I couldn't do without. So now let me just show this little demo here. Um, I've got the Volca drum which is a stereo device. And uh, to start with, I'm gonna just have it come straight into the field recorder. And um, I've got a track that I made, or you know, a program that I made special for it, and uh, I'll play it right now. And you're probably gonna need your headphones to make any sense of this. I've got one sound that's on the left, one sound that's on the right, and then a hat sound that's on both, it's in the center. Now what I'm going to do is switch that up and send it through the Dude Mixer from Basel Instruments. and. Uh, so I'm putting that in there and then taking it out of the mixer. And so uh, that's going to give us this. And so now all you hear is that left side and the center part. You don't hear the right side. So this is sort of the first cautionary aspect, which is that this thing is just expecting mono input. So it's throwing away the right side not mixing them together. The next thing, and this is something useful to just talk about in the first place, is using a Y cable to get both channels. So uh, I'm gonna get rid of that and put the stereo into the Volca drum. And then I'm gonna put uh, that on the right, that on the left, and then turn on the second channel, hit play, see how that sounds. Now, it's important to point out that we're hearing it all, but it's not stereo anymore. I'm putting one into channel one, so the left, I'm putting the right into channel two, and then it's coming through the dude, getting flattened to mono, and coming into the field recorder as the same thing on both sides. So this might be more of what you want to do. Now, the place that I want to go from here though is to show that not all Y cables are the same because uh, something like a headphone splitter is going to do something entirely different. So if I unplug that, um, let me grab this one and put a couple of aux cables in there and you can pretty much guess what this is going to do um, it's going to copy the stereo and put it into both sides one and two and so now we just are still totally missing the right hand side All right, so uh, then I'll just keep going with that. This is a, another headphone sharing one that doesn't even behave the same way as the original one that I have. And then this is a different type of 
Y cable that has audio, stereo audio on one side and a microphone uh, on the other side. We'll talk about that some in the next, but that doesn't work for this. But then here's a Y cable that it's uh, actually for microphones, doing stereo microphones into a field recorder. And uh, so that what it will do, I mean, I was sort of surprised by this, uh, but if you logic out the conductors, it makes sense. It works the same as the other Y cable. So here's a Y cable that's specific for microphones and it will work in this case, but this type of, so, so it does the same as this, but this cable will, will not work right with the microphones. And so the upshot of this is to just make sure that when you uh, do route things in a way that maybe you haven't tried before, make sure that you're not losing part of the signal. Another place where this can happen, or a sort of specific instance where this can happen, is when you have a stereo effect, like a reverb, and uh, you may think, oh, well, I've only got like a mono signal or whatever, so it might be okay. But if half of that stereo signal gets cut off, then you'll still hear the reverb tail. It'll sound like reverb, but it loses that sense of spatialization that that comes from things like phase differences in the uh, two channels. So uh, just have to make sure that things sound the way that you want them to all the way along your signal pathway. So, all right, uh, that's enough about stereo. I have one more thing to talk about on audio, and that is a uh, four pole connector. All right, so at the risk of uh, being overwhelming here on audio, the last thing to talk about is four pole plugs. And so uh, another term for a four pole plug is a T R R S. So tip ring one ring two, and then the sleeve. And, uh, this all boils down to the, the only thing I ever have known that these are used for is microphones. And, uh, so if you take something like a typical earbud, here's, uh, I think this is a skull candy set. Uh, it's got stereo ear, earplugs and a, uh, inline mic for here and I tell you what there's a part of me that just thinks well it should be that it's left and then right on the first ring and then the microphone and then the sleeve would be the ground everything would make perfect sense but that is not the way that backward compatibility works so uh, left audio out on the tip right audio out on the ring and then grounding on the second ring and then the sleeve is the microphone and so uh, this turns out to be good that if uh, you're doing something that doesn't have a mic uh, it just ends up potentially getting grounded along with it but it doesn't always work out that way if things aren't plugged in all the way or the internals of a jack are wrong or not exactly what you need uh, so sometimes i'll plug a uh, four conductor plug into a three conductor jack and it will not work but anyway point is is that's where the microphone is on that uh, fourth conductor and uh, a lot of different types have it um, here is a uh, just a lav mic that's got four conductor there are plugs that uh, it's a little hard to see this is a thing that can uh, converts um, four conductor to three conductor so that instead of going into something like a uh, here's a converter that would put the mic into a smartphone iPhone um, I can have the four to the three um, this would make it work in my field recorder so it's a lot of different types of things that you can uh, run into with this here's a uh, audio uh, stereo on the green and then uh, microphone on the red and uh, that goes into a four pole on the other side so that's the other type of Y connector I was talking about and this seems like something that probably might not be that relevant to synth stuff 
but I was a little misleading at the beginning of this uh, audio section. The uh, MicroFreak has a stereo uh, head headphone, but it's not a TRS jack. It's a TRRS jack. And that's because when they were making the MicroFreak, I guess they knew that they wanted to have a vocoder for it. So the microphone port is actually down in the headphone jack there. So just bear that in mind. And uh, I think it only comes up if you are doing stuff that has to do with field recording microphones and that sort of thing. So uh, most synths don't have anything to do with four pole plugs. All right, so let's move on to MIDI. All right, I'll uh, start talking about the cables in just a second, but I think it's a good idea just to talk about what MIDI is in general. It is a digital protocol that enables uh, one type of device to talk to another type of device. And so you can have sort of a whole network of musical gear that is mediated by MIDI. And the type of information that MIDI can carry can be uh, quite uh, different. It can be things like notes with velocities. That's sort of the main thing that I tend to think of. But then there are also so-called CC MIDI signals that uh, I think it's control change. Um, that would be the equivalent of uh, turning a knob on something like a Volca, and you can do that with MIDI uh, remotely. So uh, you can think of it as parameter control and uh, note and velocity signals as well. Now, there's also the concept of uh, MIDI channel, and uh, you can think of that as just like a sort of routing where that you can have a source that can send uh, multiple signals to different instruments that are determined by the channel. And so if you want to send one signal to one piece of gear, you put that on one channel. And if you want to send it to another piece of gear, you put that on another channel. And I'll be showing a little piece of gear in a second that will make that sort of thing more clear. Now, by way of example, one thing you could do is just have a uh, Korg SQ-1 like this. And uh, there is a MIDI out uh, port here and a MIDI in port on a Volca. So you can have a sequencer control a instrument. That's sort of the basic aspect of it. But... Uh, already we see a thing here where the, this is a big connector, this is a tiny connector, and so that is probably a good point to start talking about cables. That a typical MIDI cable is this. It's a 5-pin DIN cable. It's a D-I-N, and uh, that's what I call it at least. Um, it's an acronym for, uh, I think, a German standardization, and... Uh, it's not even quite specific. There are a bunch of different types of five pin DIN cables. So I think just calling it a MIDI cable is uh, probably the most accurate. And so come in different sizes. Uh, here's a real long one. Um, the uh, real issue is that sometimes we have this type of port to plug it into and other times we have this type. And so that's when you get into these things that are called MIDI breakout cables. And typically these come with the gear that you purchase. So uh, for an SQ-1, if I have uh, this breakout cable, I can put that into the MIDI port and then this over here and should be able to control it successfully. Now, uh, one thing to point out immediately is that uh, I don't have very many of them, only two. Um, this is a uh, breakout cable that the 3.5 millimeter side only has two conductors. So that's one sort of standard, but then the most common, as you can see by this mass of them that I have here, um, is a three conductor. So it's basically just an aux plug on one end and a five pin female on the other end. And the sure way to do all of this is that if your gear comes with a breakout cable, try to keep track of which piece of gear belongs to which breakout cable. And then that way, if worse comes to worse, you would 
just have to um, have a regular MIDI cable in the middle and then two breakout cables, one on each end. But in the ideal case, uh, part of the thing about this three and a half millimeter connector, let me grab, this is uh, model samples, model cycles. Um, so you'll see here that it's got, they both have a MIDI in port and then they have a MIDI out slash through port. And uh, what that means is that um, you could send MIDI out from say the model cycles to MIDI in on the model samples just using an aux cable. And so you don't need to have a 5-pin cable anywhere involved. But that's a case of two instruments that are sort of designed for that. And this is a good point to talk about the MIDI through concept that you can have a source of MIDI, say uh, this box, and have that come into the other box and then come out the through and uh, on to other gear. So uh, that type of hookup is quite common. And I'll just make the point that it's hard to know what type of gear is going to have what type of port on it. You know, it, it doesn't really matter. It, was, it, it is what it is. But the uh, Microfreak is a fairly bulky uh, instrument. You know, it's got a pretty good uh, depth to it. But it still has the little ports on it. And uh, in contrast, here's a tiny Basil Illuminati. And... Uh, it's got the five pin port on it. So, uh, you know, I got other things. Here's the Gecko Loop Synth. It's got the um, small one, no surprise. And then the uh, Micro Granny has got the five pin. So it's kind of a mixed bag. You just have to see what you're working with to get it hooked up. I have a kind of an outlier here. This is a Chase Bliss uh, Mood Pedal. It's got a quarter inch TRS. MIDI port and uh, I think it's the only one that I have so uh, that is probably enough about cables just try to um, I think be organized about your breakout cables that's probably the best advice that I can give but next thing I want to do is talk about some different little uh, I'll call them uh, MIDI gadgets because uh, that's where you can get a lot of value out of using MIDI okay I have some crazy stuff set up here but gotta say that uh, at the beginning when I was sort of first starting out doing this type of stuff it was really kind of the, the, the joy of it to get some little things that were typically MIDI oriented and to try and figure out how to hook things up uh, it, it can be an interesting exercise and a good way to do some music but let me start with uh, something quite basic this is a uh, MIDI Solutions brand Quadra Through, and I'm sure there are many other brands, but uh, this thing is not powered. All it is is a uh, input, and then I think it just copies the voltages into some other uh, uh, ports over here. So it's one in and four out, and so this would be a way where that you send a signal, say from a um, one synth and uh you know or it could be a box something like a dig attack or something like that that uh, where you can put different tracks on different channels and then that all comes out to here but then you can have each of these throughs go to a different device and by selecting say uh, this is channel one this is channel two three four you can have uh, the ability to control multiple instruments from one. So it's quite powerful. So I should have already pointed it out that I think MIDI is, uh, it has sort of an optical aspect to the interface. And so what I mean by that is that there is a uh, thing that receives the electrical signal in the input for MIDI and then converts that to an optical signal and then that gets converted back to a electrical signal that's used in a device. And uh, what it does basically is make sure that two devices are well isolated from one another. I think the main goal is to try and make it to where that one instrument can't somehow damage another. 
Uh, another gadget, this is highly specialized, but if you do little bits, there is a MIDI bit that allows you to basically hook the computer up to your little bits and control things quite easily. So that's pretty cool if you're into that. Uh, I have the trusty SQ-1 here as a MIDI gadget because uh, it's very nice that you can hook a computer, so say your DAW, up to the SQ-1, see the different channels, the two, the A and the B channels, and uh, then take MIDI input from your DAW and convert that to CV output. And uh, it's uh, sort of a little used feature of the SQ-1 that you can do MIDI to CV, and it's quite powerful. Now, this is one of my very favorite little uh, MIDI gadgets. This is a MIDI 2x2 box. And what it is, again, the brand is MIDI Plus. This is a USB input, so it's something that you would hook to your computer. And I say, you know, your DAW, but this could be uh, something like pure data or some coding language or whatever that just enables your computer by MIDI to talk to a MIDI device, this box. And then over here we have an in and an out. This is side A and an in and an out for side B. So it, it lets you go from the computer to this type of MIDI cable very easily. And so it's a powerful converter. These things are not very expensive either, but a great way to have your computer be the thing that is controlling a, uh, a set of your gear. And you can imagine that if you uh, combine these, that it would enable you to send uh, different channel MIDI signals out of, say, one side of this and then into the quadra through and split the channels off. So uh, a lot of power from just these little and relatively inexpensive boxes now the next thing i want to get into and i don't know this is i'm i'm not being <laughs> paid by midi plus or something like that they just have a lot of nice relatively inexpensive stuff this is a usb midi host and you'll see that certain things are claimed to me to be a midi host like my organelle is a midi host or this thing is a MIDI host. I'll get to that in a second, but this is a generic MIDI host, which means that you can put some sort of USB uh, device in here. So uh, there are a lot of different MIDI controllers that are just USB. So for example, this is a, a MIDI Fighter Twister. It's just a big uh, array of knobs. Um, the only way to connect to this thing is through USB. So typically you would have to have it hooked to a computer, but like right now I've got it born to this host box and then the host box on the other side has an out and an in. So in this case, I'm just using MIDI that's coming out. So I'm going to have a control change from over here on the twister that goes through to USB and then out the MIDI cable and into this Volca and uh, Hopefully it'll work. It's just a volume control, but... All right, so this is the volume as, as is. Uh, it, may, it may be like an amplitude control, but anyway, I didn't look too hard. I just found something that did something. So I'm gonna uh, turn a knob on the twister. Okay, and the thing to think about is that none of this is plugged in, okay? Uh, the host box is running off a battery, so the twister is being powered by a battery. Volca is running on its batteries. The speaker that I'm using is powered by batteries. So none of this requires a wall adapter or a computer. So just as an example, uh, this could be a thing where the You've got uh, sequences that you like on your Volca keys or some other Volca, but you want to be able to change the parameters in some sort of live setting. You don't want to carry around a laptop or that type of thing. And so uh, this would be a way to do it where you program the twister knobs to be certain CC signals. Those get routed 
MIDI through the box, through the MIDI cable, and then control the parameters on the Volca. So it's an interesting setup, a way to sort of do the uh, dollless thing. And so I'm not necessarily advocating, oh, don't use a laptop, go dollless or whatever. I think, you know, use whatever you want, but uh, I, I tend to just hop around and do uh, whatever fits a, a particular project or that sort of thing. But it can be nice to sort of cut out the middleman and have a controller and an instrument without really anything in between, just this little box. Now, the last thing I want to show is a... Uh, I, I, it's really something that I got a long time ago. Um, let's see. Uh, this is called a MIDI Engine USB, again from MIDI Plus. And it's just a device that uh, follows the uh, general MIDI protocol. General MIDI was a thing, I guess, from the maybe 70s or 80s, where the keyboards and such would have certain default instruments. And uh, so let me... I'm going to put that in so the speaker's hooked up. What this does is uh, basically, um, I'm trying to think how to explain this. It's I've got a MIDI controller here, and then it's being hosted on this little box. And then I can have this be a bunch of different instruments, depending on uh, what I select. So let me just hit a pad, see if we get a sound. OK, so piano. And then I can change. All right, and so this controller is set up with some different channels or something like that. So um, you can already see, whoops. Um, I don't know what any of these are. Yeah, so this one's always piano for some reason. Uh, I think I probably, if I went to this and then changed that, then maybe that would... Wow, okay. Oh, three things now. Anyway, it's quite a bit of fun, and... Uh, it's got built-in reverb, volume control, that type of thing. And again, I'll just make the point that this thing has a rechargeable battery. The MIDI engine does as part of it. So you charge it with a USB cable. And then um, if you had something like a little MIDI keyboard and a pair of headphones, this would enable you to play that keyboard with uh, all sorts of different voices. And uh, so... You know, it's something to think about as like a little mini uh, voice that's not really a, it's not a synth, it's not a sampler, it's somewhere sort of in between where it's just a, um, it's akin to a fixed keyboard like a Casio or something like that, but in a really portable and cool format. All right, so that's just sort of a summary of uh, the different types of MIDI gadgets that are out there. I'm sure there are others. Um, I hope that you found this little overview to be informative. Now, as I uh, talked about in the last section, there's a strong connection between MIDI and USB, and there's also a strong connection between audio and USB, and I want to talk about both. But to start with, just some nomenclature, what I think of as a USB port or a USB jack looks like this. It's a USB type a female and uh, so then what we think of as normally i guess a usb plug that's ubiquitous uh, that is a usb type a male and then the uh, sort of most common set of usbs at least up until recently uh, you've got the big one which is the actual type b male and then next size down is the mini and uh so this is also type B male, but mini. And then uh, you got the um, micro. So it's just some different sizes of the same thing. Again, type B male micro. And then more recently, the USB type C. 
which is mercifully independent of the orientation in which it's plugged in. Now, my experience with USB generally, uh, with the PC, with the Mac, is uh, that it pretty much works as intended, and that when things, the place where things that really start to get a little bit dicey is with iOS, so uh, either my phone or uh, an iPad, if you have Android, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about might apply. I think there's probably some equivalent types of things. Uh, hopefully it's not as finicky as the iPhone can tend to be. So uh, the first thing to talk about is going to be audio. And uh, a lot of times people use USB for audio interfaces. I have a field recorder here that is set up in audio interface mode. And I'll just make that point that... You may think, uh, oh, I don't have an audio interface, but a lot of the stuff that we get, like synths, field recorders, they have built-in audio interfaces. So, like, right now, I've got the Korg Monotron output going into this thing, the field recorder. This is a Zoom H1N, have the volume set, and then that is going by USB micro to a uh, adapter here that's... USB female to lightning and going into my phone. And so all I'm going to do is uh, record a video and uh, if I can get to that and uh, we'll flip it the other way. So now you can see my ceiling fan, my mic, and uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, hit record. Uh, let me go to video and uh, hit record, play some stuff on the monotron. Now, we're not going to hear it, uh, which I can explain. The video app on the iPhone does not do monitoring. So if we were in something like Koala Sampler, you would have heard that when I played it. These are just some nuances to keep in mind whether things monitor or not, because it might be working and you don't realize it. Now, all I'm going to do is uh, go to that recording that I just did. Okay, so that was audio from the monotron that went into the audio interface of the H1N and then was sent out by USB into the phone. And the uh, audio interface, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, people will say, oh, it's the first thing you have to have or whatever, but it's just better at capturing sound from gear and sort of... Uh, it puts it into, I guess, more of a buffered or packeted type state and then sends that to the phone. And so, like, the synchronization and the quality and that sort of thing is improved versus just somehow maybe if you send it into a mic port or that type of thing. And so this is just a simple, crude version of what people do all the time, which is have gear that goes to an audio interface, follows by USB into some sort of recorder, be it video with an audio track or just a audio recording to make higher quality sound files. Now, the next thing I want to say is that I've got some bits and pieces out here that are useful. Um, in this case, I used just the simplest thing that you can use, which is a, a USB female to lightning to get the signal into my phone. Uh, you know, I have two of these. Here's the other one. And sometimes they work, but sometimes they don't. What you might find is that you need what is called a camera adapter for the iPhone. So this is lightning on one side. And then a USB female over here that takes some sort of signal. We're going to use a MIDI controller into this in just a second. And then there's another lightning port over here to take power. And so if you only had one of these lightning to USB types of adapters, I'd say go for the camera adapter because uh, by having power, it makes it to where uh, different types of gear are more likely to work. One last little thing that I forgot to mention is this thing, which is a four port USB adapter. So basically uh, one thing in here, um, four over here. Uh, it seems kind of crazy because this thing is uh, basically unpowered. I think you can power it, but I don't. But this thing allows things to work that normally wouldn't with the phone. I'll show that in a second. But the 
uh, the gist of it is that this thing, by just having it in line, sort of tricks your phone into thinking everything is okay. Uh, this was a trick that I learned uh, from a video by Tatro a long time ago. Uh, he used it to get the, uh, it's a, a Kai MIDI controller to work with his phone or tablet or something like that. But uh, just sort of giving out some thoughts on things you might need to get uh, your gear to work. The other thing you need is a lot of patience because this stuff, it can be finicky. Like it, it depends on what order you plug things into. Uh, so for example, that thing I just showed with the, um, with the cork monotron, um, that zoom recorder only works as an audio interface correctly if you plug everything into it, uh, last. And so anyway, just patience and persistence if you have trouble getting your stuff to work. Well, mixed results. Uh, I couldn't get the Launchpad Mini really to work with the phone. It's got a lot of lights and stuff. I thought with the power thing, I've gotten it to work before. Uh, I have to take my own advice and exercise some patience to try to do that at some point. Um, then uh, I couldn't get the uh, Nanopad to work right with um, Koala sampler to where the, these pads did those pads. So I moved on to the uh, nano key. Um, that worked fine. And then I thought, well, I'll try the uh, thing that I mentioned earlier that was on a Tatro video. This is the Akai MPK Mini Mark II. And uh, it actually works pretty nice with the uh, Koala sampler. Uh, I've got it uh, just a regular USB A cable and then a uh, USB to lightning, no camera adapter or anything like that and it actually works. And it's polyphonic. And I've got the sound coming out of a Bluetooth speaker so it's just coming into my voice mic but uh, not that bad. I don't know what else I have on here. So I think that's about all I want to say about USB is that uh, a lot of times it can work fine, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, there are a few tricks you can try to employ, um, just good luck with it. And uh, so now I want to move on to more of the demo part of this video. Okay, so now for the slightly more philosophical part of this video. and. I think the place to really start is to think about why we have cables in the first place. And it has to do with modularity. And this is not just something that is specific to modular synthesis, which I've already talked about a little bit, but it's more like, you know, basically a lot of the things that we have are modular. I was just reading an article about quantum computing and one of the next big steps in quantum computing is modularity. And what it comes down to is, for example, in music, you know, I've got a synth, I've got an effect, and I have, say, a recorder to get the sound onto. I mean, you could think about, well, what if we just had all of that in one box? And that's kind of like a maybe a um, Roland SP404, something like that, where it's got those three abilities all in one. But the, well, I mean, it's more of a sampler than a synth, but uh, you could make a sample of a synth. But the point is that when we've got this modularity of pieces of gear and we have the cables in between, it gives us a sort of a, like in hacker terms, a vulnerability where the, we can put our own thing in the middle or we can reroute things in a different way. And uh, that's a lot of uh, the thinking that can go into doing experimental music where that you uh, see how something is supposed to be hooked up and then you think about other ways that it can be hooked up. 
So I just want to walk through a few examples of that type of process. And so even if you're just starting out uh, and have looked at this for the basics about the cables, uh, some of this other stuff might be something that gives you some ideas that you could use along the way. All right, so this is just sort of a small setup to kind of warm up with the Korg SQ1 as a sequencer, the Korg NTS1 as the voice, and then I'm also going to be using the Basil Dude as a way to mix uh, synchronization signals. And so this is a little bit of a centered thing on the dude and if you don't have one might be something that could work with another type of mixer you just have to sort of check it out um, i also want to make the point that uh, for january on the 17th so that would be a january 17th short here on youtube i did a similar type of cable uh, i guess sort of uh, connectivity thing with a knuckle bone where the I use the dude's feedback uh, mechanism. It's an, basically an amplifier slash mixer that uh, does have the ability to make a tone. And by using the knuckle bone, I was able to sort of turn the channel keys into a uh, sort of a tone control keys. I won't say a keyboard, but kind of that type of concept. So if you're interested in using the dude for that sort of thing, go check that short out and make sure to read some of the admonitions about using this type of feedback. But the basis of this demo is I'm going to be taking sporadic synchronization triggers from the SQ1. And the way that I'm doing that, I've got it in random mode. So it's just sort of skipping around. It's not really moving very quickly. And, uh, I'm using the CV out as a trigger signal. So uh, some of these uh, steps I have turned up high enough to trigger the NTS-1's synchronization. Others are not. So it's just going to give a sporadic signal. So when I turn on that channel of the dude, it's going to just occasionally play a little blip from the NTS-1. And so it's sort of random and you can tell that I've already got the delay on there. And, uh, the, the next aspect of this, the main aspect of this, and the reason it's in sort of this cables video is that I'm taking the audio signal out with a Y cable. So it's a TRS stereo cable. One part of that is just going into the field recorder as the sound that you're hearing from the NTS one. But the other part is going into the second channel on the dude. And uh, so it means that the audio from the NTS-1 is going to get mixed into the trigger signal and also be synchronizing the NTS-1. So it's going to sort of synchronize itself. And this is sort of the notion of a generative setup where the, uh, it's a little bit sensitive and unpredictable and sort of feeds back upon itself. All right, so I'm going to start by turning on the random sinks. And then I'm going to add in the audio sinks and gradually turn up the amplification of that audio. And a lot of this is highly dependent on the delay parameters and on the envelope parameters of each of the notes. All right, I didn't touch anything there. It's kind of building up steam.
And that's sort of a classic hallmark of a generative or feedback type thing where there's a sensitivity to the parameters like that. And just by messing around with the different arpeggio settings and the delay parameters, you can get some nice effects. All right, so here's another little quick setup that is uh, based on the SQ1 and in this case the Arteria Microbrute. And to start with, I've got it set up in what I'll call the normal way, which is I've got the CV headed to pitch and then the gate headed to the gate in. And so it's just basically playing a sequence on the uh, Microbrute. I'm going to fire that up and do the filter a little bit. Okay, so that's sort of the classic setup of sequencer and uh, synthesizer. It's nice. I like that sound. I'm not trying to say that what I'm uh, going to show is in some way better than that. It's just different. And so if you've got the microbrute, this doesn't even take a different cable. I've talked about this, I think, maybe two or three other times on the channel. Um, you just need to hook the synth up a little bit differently than you might normally think. And uh, to do that, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of running the CV into the pitch, I'm going to run it into the filter. And so it's going to be a thing where that we've got a fixed noise source. And then we're going to dodge the filter around to give the sort of uh, melodic and rhythmic element to this. And then when I say noise source, I mean it that if you, um, turns out, I don't know, I just sort of discovered it by accident, but if you take the pitch out of the microbrute and put it back to its own pitch in, and I've done this a lot and it's never hurt anything, uh, it basically makes it play sort of a wonky scale on the keyboards, like a whole tone scale. Not that that's that wonky, but... Uh, if you take the octave all the way up and you play the very highest key and you have metalizer up all the way and you're in the triangle mode, it becomes a noise source. So I'm going to hit this. So we're in the noise mode. And then I'm going to hit the sequencer, which is now going to be gating. So the sound is going to be enabled by the gate same as normal in the sequencer but it's going to be a fixed source the noise and then the filter is going to be what's being sequenced so uh, let's do that <laughs> And it's really dependent on the way the release is set and uh, some of these other like things like the uh, envelope amount. So again, just that routing of pitch out to pitch in. So there's the cables 101 thing that just using the same cable in a different way, you might be able to get some different behavior. Octave all the way up and hit the highest key. And I'm just going to play this for a second. And 
and you know, depending on how you have the CV set for the sequence, you can even get some uh, pretty percussive sounds, almost like a tom or that type of thing. And it's a little different with the uh, band pass versus slow pass, and uh, I'll even try high pass just for the sake of it. I'm changing the duty cycle, so it's getting into sort of click hop, hi hat type of territory. I feel like the low pass is still maybe the most reliable, but uh, anyway, it's a lot of fun. I uh, hope you explore this and enjoy it. Alright, so for the last demo of this part, it's going to be a little bit like the uh, first one where that I'm doing some stuff with the synchronization. I've got four Volcas here, but uh, it's set up a little bit differently in terms of the synchronization. And you can already tell that because some of the things, like if you follow the lights on the sample here, it'll dash a little bit and then go slow. And so just to clarify what's going on, I'm using the Volca drum as a uh, sync out, and I'm using the uh, Volca FM as a sync out, but they're going into a headphone sharing thing, and this is doing a thing called trig stacking, where the, uh, I have them running into the in on the, so the sync in on the um, Volca modular, and uh, then that's going to make it to where the, okay, I think I've got this one set at maybe 20. I think that's right. So 20 BPM. I think this one's set at 30 BPM. And so they're not really together, the drum and the FM, but then uh, they're going to combine and have sort of the, um, the, the um, modular is going to be sort of a connector. And then I've got the uh, out from the, modular going into the sample over here. So I'm just going to sort of turn these up gradually so that you can kind of hear them and uh, we'll see how it goes. So real slow on the drum. Then I'm going to turn up the FM. I've got the arpeggio running on that. It may take me a minute to get some of the mixes right here, but then I'm going to add in the modular. And I've got three 16-beat uh, patterns chained together on the modular, so it's sort of a little bit of a song compared to the others, which are all just 16. sample.
All right, so I've messed with the levels and some of the uh, arpeggio and modular settings and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it's kind of simple. It's sort of an alien rhythm, but I think that's the point of doing this uh, trick stacking sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's just sort of a sleepy little jam. And uh, I hope it will give some ideas of things to try. So let's just listen to it for a second. All right, well, I hope everybody got something out of this video. Uh, it can be a lot. There's a lot of just basics about the ways that you can hook up gear. Audio in particular has a lot of nuances and there are things that I didn't really have a chance to get much into, like ground loops and that sort of thing. Best advice on that is hook things up with a battery if you can, uh, that can help. But anyway, I am gonna leave it at that and if you have any specific questions about this type of stuff then just drop me a comment and i will try to answer it and uh, i feel like the the last thing that i was just doing with the microbrew was uh, pretty nice so i'm gonna put uh, reverb onto that actually I'm, I'm gonna hook the microcosm up to it and we'll see how that goes i think it could end up being pretty nice so uh, thanks very much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one.